The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now, it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros of the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show, Nature AC and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, we are so glad to have you with us as we wrap up 2017 on the program today. This is our last live show of the year. Joining us today will be Dave Nottig, CEO of ETF.com. Of course, ETF.com is one of the world's leading authorities on ETFs, and we always enjoy visiting with Dave. I like to say there aren't five people walking the face of the earth that know more about ETFs than Dave does. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week with Bloomberg's Eric Balchunez. We'll recap ETFs in 2017, and then we'll spend the bulk of our conversation looking ahead to 2018. We'll hear some of Dave's ETF predictions and talk about some of the broader ETF trends and why they matter to you as an investor. We'll certainly try to cover as much ground as we possibly can with Dave. And then later in the show, we have another excellent guest set to join us, Dan Ahrens, Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer at Advisor Shares, is going to spotlight the Advisor Shares Vice ETF. This just launched last week, and it's the first ETF offering concentrated exposure to companies involved with alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco. Dan is the uh, portfolio manager for this ETF. I think this is going to be a really interesting spotlight, in particular because of the cannabis angle to this ETF. Uh, there are a couple of other ETF providers attempting to launch marijuana-themed ETFs, but this Advisor Shares ETF is first to market with at least some dedicated exposure. Uh, Connor, this should be a fun show to close out uh, 2017 today. It, Dave is really the perfect guy to, to wrap up our year on the show, Nate, with, with and recap just a, a record-breaking year for ETFs and talk about what is ahead in, in 2018. And then we really do have a pretty interesting ETFs to spotlight. Like you mentioned, the Advisor Shares Vice ETF. Uh, I get quite a few questions from clients about when a cannabis or marijuana ETF will be available and, you know, how, how can you start investing in that space because a lot of people expect it to really explode um, as more and more states every year legalize marijuana, if not recreationally, at least uh, medicinally. And this is the first ETF to market with some significant focused cannabis exposure. So really looking forward to that conversation. And Nate, like you mentioned, this is our last live show of 2017. We will have a best of show that will air next week, which are always our, our great, you know, most recent interviews and, and are always very popular. I, I do want to take a second here as we wrap up the year to, to thank all of our listeners for the support this year. We've had significant growth in our in our podcast downloads, and we're very grateful to everyone who listens. And we're looking forward to another phenomenal year of guests and interesting topics that will undoubtedly come up in 2018. Well, I would certainly echo all of those comments. We really appreciate everyone listening to the show. Uh, we are always amazed at how and where people find us. And I would add that we love hearing from you. If there are guests you'd like for us to have on the show, ETF topics you'd like for us to cover, please drop us a line. You can email us at advice at etfstore.com, uh, or you can find us on Twitter at ETF store. I would also add that we would greatly appreciate it if you could give us a quick review, especially at uh, Apple iTunes. That helps other listeners find our program and hopefully spread the word on ETF education. But Connor, it has been a blast on the show this year. I was looking last week. We've had over 35 different ETF providers on the program. We've had independent resources from places like Bloomberg and ETF.com. 
the head of trading at, at KCG, now Virtue, which is one of the largest trading firms, the World Gold Council, uh, two cryptocurrency experts, just some really interesting guests and perspectives. And on that note, uh, as you mentioned, next week we will air one of our best of shows. We have three of our favorite conversations from the back half of the year lined up. And then just a, a quick preview here, looking ahead to January 2nd to kick off the new year, Mike Strain, who is Director of Economic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. This is one of the preeminent think tanks in Washington, D.C. Mike is going to give us his economic outlook for 20, uh, 2018, uh, and we'll focus specifically on the impact of tax reform and the potential for an infrastructure spending bill. We'll also be joined that week by Hal Lambert, who is founder and CEO at Point Bridge Capital, He's going to spotlight the Point Bridge GOP Stock Tracker ETF, and the ticker symbol on that is MAGA. So that's the Make America Great Again, uh, President Trump slogan. But that ETF holds companies whose uh, employees and political action committees are highly supportive of Republican candidates. So uh, that should be a great show as well. You know, Mike Strain has, has kicked off the year for us like this several straight years, and it's just a phenomenal insight from somebody who's not in the day-to-day investment world, but more from a political and economic perspective and what we can see uh, potentially ahead in 2018 and how that impacts us as investors. And with, you know, the likely passing of the Republican tax bill this week um, and other, you know, uh, large decisions pending out of Washington, D.C., I think it's going to be a phenomenal conversation with Mike um, in early January. All right. Now, before Dave Nodig and Dan Ahrens join us, Let's briefly recap the week and the year in the financial markets. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Another record-setting week for stocks last week. The S&P 500 was up close to 1%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained 1.3%. And the NASDAQ was up nearly 2% for the week. And Connor, by the way, do we need to start including Bitcoin in these weekly uh, market updates? I CNBC saw, does. So that's I... what I was going to say. I, I, <laughs> that was on the bottom of the uh, the TV screen on CNBC. But if you are curious, Bitcoin closed last week at seventeen thousand five hundred. Uh, I'm sure the price has moved significantly since then. Interestingly, on the topic of Bitcoin, the Fed held their regularly scheduled policy meeting last week. And as widely expected, they raised interest rates by a quarter percent. And they made it clear they see the strength in the economy and jobs market continuing. But Fed Chair Janet Yellen actually commented on Bitcoin in the press conference afterwards. Take a listen to this. And then you asked about Bitcoin. And there I would simply say that um, Bitcoin at this time plays a very small role in the payment system. It is not a stable source of store of value, and it doesn't constitute legal tender. It is a highly speculative asset, and the Fed doesn't really play any role, any regulatory role, with respect to Bitcoin other than assuring that Um, banking organizations that we do supervise um, are attentive that they're appropriately managing any interactions they have with participants in that market and appropriately monitoring um, anti-money laundering bank secrecy act, um, you know, responsibilities that they have. And actually, later in that uh, press conference, Janet Yellen was also asked about whether Bitcoin posed a risk to the stability of the financial system. And her response was basically that Bitcoin is too small and not tied in enough to the existing banking system to really matter at this point. But kind of, I've got to tell you, it was almost surreal seeing Bitcoin prices running on CNBC last week and, and then hearing the Fed comment on it. And I just don't think we could wrap up 2017 without at least mentioning this remarkable rise of Bitcoin. No, it, it was simply a unbelievable year in terms of Bitcoin. Not only the rise of its uh, value going from roughly thousand dollars per coin at the start of January to now, you know, flirting with eighteen thousand, broke eighteen, almost nineteen thousand earlier last week. <clears throat> Not only is this, you know, a, a rocket in terms of the the uh, value of the of Bitcoin, but also just in the exposure. Right. And from something that truly very people had even heard of back in January to now being, like you said, running on the ticker at the bottom of CNBC and any other financial network, 
to having the chair of the Fed comment on Bitcoin at the last public hearing of the year is astounding. And as we wrap the year up, you know, I don't think there's any other option than to call 2017 the the year of Bitcoin. And I do have a feeling we're going to continue uh, hearing plenty about it and, and talking about crypto assets as a whole, um, possibly even more next year. All right. Now, quickly here, there are still six or seven trading days left in 2017. But let's run down year-to-date returns for some major asset classes, uh, because after all, there are other things to invest in besides Bitcoin. Uh, these returns are all through last Friday. The S&P 500, so large cap U.S. stocks, they're up nearly 22%. Small cap U.S. stocks are up 14 percent. Developed international stocks, so think about places like Europe and Japan, uh, they're broadly up 24 percent. And emerging market stocks are up close to 27 percent. Moving on to bonds, broad-based bonds, so uh, the Bloomberg Barclays U.S. Ag Bond Index, that's up nearly 4 percent. Intermediate term treasuries are up close to 3 percent. High yield bonds, 6 percent. And broad-based uh, international bonds, currency hedged, are up nearly 3%. Lastly, gold is up 8%. REITs, 6%. And broad-based commodities are the only negative major asset class. are down about 1%. Uh, any parting thoughts here for 2017 <coughs> besides Bitcoin? Nate, another asset class worth mentioning here is frontier markets. And these are economies that are actually less developed than emerging markets. You know, countries like Kuwait, Argentina, Vietnam, Morocco make up uh, the largest exposure in, in frontier markets. But that asset class was up over 36% year-to-date. I mean, just amazing growth. There's no other way to describe this year than a global bull market in equities. It was very difficult to lose money if you were investing in broad equity ETFs over the past year. And I do want to mention it was encouraging to see some outperformance from equities outside of the U.S. You know, developed uh, international equities and emerging markets in particular. These are two areas that have underperformed the S&P 500 for the majority of the recovery in the markets since 2009. So it's been nice for diversified investors to finally see the benefits of owning equities outside of the U.S. this year because that feeling, frankly, hasn't been around a lot since this recovery started in 2009 in, in U.S. stocks. Yeah, no doubt it was a great year for international stocks. And you're right, it was certainly nice to see diversified investors rewarded for a change. But look, even for the S&P 500, this is actually the second best year since the big returns in 2009. The only better year was 2013. I, I think that may surprise a few people. But look, we need to take a break here. I think a good way to wrap a bow on this year and look ahead to next year is to simply remember some of the market predictions from back in late December 2016 and then early January of this year. And I walked through these a couple of months ago. But on December 17th last year, Forbes had a headline. Listen to this. 2017 stock market outlook. Why you need to be cautious. On January 2nd of this year, USA Today had a headline. 2017 outlook for stocks if everything goes wrong. And then on January 3rd, uh, this is from CNBC, Streets 2017 forecast is the most bearish annual outlook in 12 years. And look, I, I know it's always easy to go back and sort of pick through the trash heap to find headlines. There's no shortage of them. But this is Forbes, USA Today, and CNBC. So I, I just think keep that in mind as you start seeing all of the 2018 predictions over the next several uh, weeks. We've covered this on the show, but it bears repeating because we are in the season of predictions, right? The, the end of one year always brings around the talking heads on TV that are going to predict what's going to happen next year. You have to remind yourself, these people have no idea what's going to happen down the road because guess what? Nobody does. And you cannot rely on headlines and short-term market predictions to impact your investing decisions. This is just long-term – this is just noise to long-term investors. And you have to think of – you know, think of if you listen to these doom and gloom predictions, Nate, that you mentioned at the start of last year. Or for that matter, you know, every year since essentially 2009, there have been predictions of market calamity bombarding investors literally since the recovery in stocks started in the U.S. And like you said, these are from 
top financial news media in the country, not some, you know, off the grid doomsday blogger, you know, living living in his mom's basement. These are, you know, top of the line um, financial media that are Im- bombarding investors with these scare headlines. And think about investors that listened to those headlines and got out of the market. They missed a phenomenal run. What you need to do as an investor is have a long-term plan in place, and you need to understand the risks you're taking in the portfolio. So, you know, if, for instance, a 20 to 30 percent pullback in stocks scares you, that doesn't mean you, you know, bail out, sell everything, and then try to call the top of the market. What it means is you need to reduce your exposure to stocks and increase your ownership of bonds and cash and gold. I mean, that's how you manage and, and approach how you handle future market volatility as an investor. Well, I did a uh, quick Google search over the weekend, and I'll leave you with a few other headlines as we uh, head to break here. Listen to these. Goldman Sachs predicts stocks will rally 11% in 2018. That from Yahoo Finance. Bull market heading for major correction in 2018, Bank of America says. That's from the street.com. Morgan Stanley predicts 2018 will be tricky for global economies, says sell U.S. corporate bonds. That from CNBC. Uh, Another CNBC headline, Credit Suisse sets 2018 forecast for stock market, predicts double-digit gain. And then lastly, Vanguard warns more volatility in 2018 may hurt equity returns. That from Bloomberg. Uh, So good luck making uh, heads or tails of uh, market predictions. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by Dave Nottig, CEO of ETF.com. We'll recap ETFs in 2017, look ahead to ETFs in 2018, and then later, Advisor Shares' Dan Ahrens will spotlight the new Advisor Shares Vice ETF. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store. Show Nature Racing and Connor Kelly in studio. Our first guest today is Dave Nottig, CEO of ETF.com. ETF.com, of course, is one of the world's leading authorities on ETFs. And Dave is simply a treasure trove of ETF knowledge. Uh, There just aren't many people, if any, who know more about ETFs than Dave does. And we're very pleased to have Dave joining us via phone today. Dave, great having you back on the program. Oh, it's great to be here. Always happy to join. Dave, let's just start with a quick recap of 2017. Last I checked, about $465 billion has gone into ETFs this year, just obliterating last year's record of around $287 billion. Give us your assessment here. Are you surprised at all? Uh, was this expected? Well, I don't think anybody can expect expect uh, nearly $500 billion in flows. You know, it's almost like we doubled last year. Uh, you know, I think we all expected this to be a strong year, but, you know, we've had this combination of strong markets, uh, a real movement into uh, low-cost beta from across, uh, you know, almost every asset class, and a lot of new players in the market, uh, which we haven't really talked much about, but they're all showing up with $500 million in there and here and there, and, you know, that all adds up. You mentioned the move to low-cost beta. Obviously, the ETF fee war continues raging on. Uh, No question that was a big story in 2017. And, look, we all know that on the balance this is clearly a good thing for investors. But ETF.com recently released a survey which found expense ratio was the most important factor for ETF investors. And that survey was primarily uh, investment advisors. In response to that, you wrote a really good piece that essentially said it's not just cost that matters. It's what you're getting for that cost. Can you expand on that a bit? Because it does feel like the focus on cost has sort of uh, overshadowed some of the other factors that can have a much greater impact on returns. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess we should be happy that investors have at least gotten the message that cost does matter. Uh, but I, there is such a thing as taking it too far. And I think when you talk to some advisors, the smart ones realize that there's a little bit of truth in you get what you pay for. You have to look a little bit beyond just getting your four or five basis point beta. 
because you need to be careful about your exposure. You need to be careful about your trading experience as well. And running an index fund isn't you know, just pushing a button on a computer. There are funds that track really well, funds that don't track as well. So you know, while it's great that investors have learned this lesson about cost, it is the one thing we can control about our investment experience. Uh, I really hope investors look beyond that and start focusing on exposure, which at the end of the day, what you own is really what determines your returns. All right. Now, before we move on to talking ETFs in 2018, I've got to ask you, do you have a favorite new ETF launch this year? Well, you know, the irony is if you look at the funds that brought in new money, um, a lot of them are ones we may never have even heard of. Last time I checked, the leader here uh, was actually uh, the Delta Shares S&P International Managed Risk ETF, which I don't think I've ever even said those words before. I mean, Delta <laughs> Shares, a new player owned by Milliman, um, they showed up with $250 million of their own assets into that fund. Uh, and, and really, if you go down the list of big launches, they almost all look like they, they all come from like places like Principal Financial Group, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, Formula Folios, uh, Goldman Sachs, people bringing their own assets to the party. Um, I would say of that batch, the one that I think is the most interesting is probably the Goldman Sachs, uh, Access Investment Grade Corporate Bond ETF, which is a true smart beta corporate fund that looks at company fundamentals to make the allocations into corporate bonds. That fund pulled in about $200 million out of the gate and only charges 14 basis points. I think that's a really interesting approach. You mentioned the bring your own assets. I know uh, Bloomberg's Eric Balchunas likes to talk about this. Is that the model uh, for success for a new ETF launch? Yeah, I mean, this is sort of one of my trends for, for next year. You know, when we look at the, the winners uh, and the new entrants, it's, it's John Hancock, like Mason, Oppenheimer, Transamerica. These are not household ETF names. They're, you know, big financial names that come from the traditional mutual fund space or even the insurance space. That's where we see new entrants having success. So you either have to come with that, that guaranteed money, BYOA, as, as Eric so nicely calls it, or I think you have to have something that's really unique and ingenious, um, and you have to get the performance hit at the same time. You know, we've seen, whether it's, you know, marijuana funds or Bitcoin funds, we've seen all these launches for unique niches in the market. That's part of it, but then you also have to have the performance. Otherwise, I think it's really tough. Our guest is Dave Nottig, CEO of ETF.com. Dave, let's talk about some of your 2018 ETF predictions. And just for fun, I went back and looked at ETF.com's 2017 ETF predictions. And I've got to say, your team did remarkably well. I would say you nailed seven or eight of the ten predictions pretty closely. Now, <laughs> let me caveat that by saying we just talked in our previous segment about ignoring predictions. Uh, we were talking about the financial markets, but... Nevertheless, let's discuss uh, your ETF predictions for 2018. I know you just posted these today at ETF.com. Uh, what are some of the things on your radar for next year? Well, you know, I think this will be a year where we start seeing some of the smart beta funds really come into their own. Uh, and really, that can go one of two ways, and it will be determined based on market performance. I'm not somebody who's going to make a bold prediction about whether the market's up or down 20% next year. Uh, but certainly, you know, any measurement of the broader equity market suggests that at some point here we're due for some kind of correction. If this is the year we see one, I think you'll see some of the lower beta, the sort of the risk averse smart beta products like maybe the, the iShares MSCI Quality Factor ETF, QUAL, or the Guggenheim Defensive Equity ETF, which is DEF. You know, those are funds that are smart beta in the sense they're trying to lower your risk while maintaining pretty standard market exposure. Those are the kinds of funds that could really have their moment in the sun if we have a big pullback because they'll be a little less risky. Uh, so, you know, that's one way I think we'll see some smart beta stars uh, form. If, we, if instead what we have is another big momentum year, another 10, 20 percent equity year, again, we have a whole raft of fairly new smart beta products out there, um, including ones that, you know, like MMTUM, I'm sorry, MMTM, which tracks uh, momentum itself. I think you'll see some of those really break out uh, if we continue this market. So I think we'll start talking more about those. We'll see that outperformance on either the up or down side, and we'll start seeing some big asset flows into those funds. They really, for all the talk of smart beta, they haven't pulled in huge assets. What about pure active ETFs? It seems like every year this is one of the predictions from, from some of the pundits that this will be the year active ETFs proliferate 
Uh, what are your thoughts on 2018? Yeah, I think that's one we really need to debunk. There's no question the active managers are showing up in the ETF space, in spades. I mean, Davis alone pulled in a couple hundred million dollars by themselves with transparent traditional stock picking equity this year. So there's an opportunity to raise assets there. But in terms of finding uh, sort of old school, shoot the lights out, out performance, I think that ship has sailed. You know, S&P uh, tracks these these things really carefully. Um, they looked at the 2000 to 2002 bear market market, the 2008 bear market, uh, and every time there's always the same prediction, which is, well, when the bear market comes, that's when you're going to see active managers outperform. Uh, in fact, in both of those bear markets, active management did just as poorly, if not worse, as it's been doing in bull markets. So I don't see any reason why a new pullback would be different for active management. I do think we'll continue to see active players show up in the ETF space, but I think they're going to have just as tough a road to hoe. Along those same lines, I know one of your bold predictions was that uh, some of these non-transparent active structures may get approved and we'll start to see ETFs uh, come out using that structure. The question that I have is, do you think that's something that investors really want? Are, Are they okay not having that transparency? Well, so I've been a fan of the non-transparent active structures, particularly the one put forth by a company called Presidian Investments, mostly because I think it's clever financial engineering that solves a problem for the asset management industry. I think your point's well taken. I'm not sure this solves a problem for investors, uh, but if there are investors out there who really want access to, I don't know, say a Gabelli, a traditional non-transparent stock-picking active manager, this may be the structure that lets them get it. Because until there is a non-transparent way to bring those products to market, we won't see a lot of those name brand active equity market uh, participants in the ETF space. So uh, whether or not it's good for investors or whether it's simply an access gate uh, remains to be seen. It is, a, it is a solution for the investment management industry more than it is for you and me, I think. Our guest is Dave Nottig, CEO of ETF.com. Dave, another uh, item you touch on in your bold predictions is ESG. And going back to ETF.com's 2017 predictions, one was that ESG ETFs would explode. For whatever reason, there seems to be a lot of media attention surrounding ESG, but the assets haven't necessarily followed yet. Do you think that changes significantly in 2018? I, you know, I think I've, I've moderated my enthusiasm for ESG a little bit. I still think it's where we're going to see a tremendous amount of product growth. Um, you know, we've, we've got 33 sort of pure ESG funds by my count, um, and we have a lot of funds that don't call themselves ESG that are getting a lot of attention for their, say, governance screens and things like that. Um, And collectively, they pulled in just under a billion dollars this year. I think, importantly, none of them had negative flows. So all of them are growing as as a class, and I see that as very positive. And I think what we'll see is a a continued trickle. We'll see an acceleration of that money coming in. Maybe next year we get a couple billion, five, ten billion dollars flowing into ESG product. That'll be long-term sticky money. That's sort of the premise here. This is not traders' money. This is long-term investors' allocations. Um, I think we'll continue to see the product line expand. I wouldn't be surprised to see another 30 or 40 ESG funds launch in this year. And I think you'll see some of them come in with big assets. We saw that when State Street launched S- uh, the SHA, the Women in Governance ETF, a few uh, two years ago. Um, that fund launched with big assets coming in from institutions. I think we'll see more of that. Dave, I'm curious. I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but can you tell us anything about the so-called ETF rule where the SEC may try to make it easier for fund companies to launch ETFs. I guess the question is, yeah, will this have any impact on the ETF landscape next year? Yeah, I mean, we definitely are in a different regulatory environment. Our new new SEC commissioner, Jay Clayton, uh, is very ETF friendly. He recently appointed Dahlia Blass uh, to run the investment management division there, which is really where ETFs go to either be born or die. Um, She comes from an ETF background as a lawyer. So we're we're certainly in an environment where at least the SEC understands ETFs, uh, there has been a lot of talk about an ETF rule that would simplify the process for bringing standard ETFs to market, not Bitcoin ETFs, not things that push the limits, but just standard, plain vanilla, unlevered, uh, long ETFs. 
Um, they still take a huge you know, amount of effort for the SEC to approve. An ETF rule would make that process simpler. It could potentially lower costs for new entrants. That gives us more options as investors. In general, that's a good thing. Um, you know, whether you can do this without actually doing any legislation, I think, remains uh, an issue. Uh, you know, ETFs live because of loopholes to existing laws that were passed, the 1940 Act. Um, uh, an ETF rule sort of has to get around that, or it has to be an actual piece of legislation. So I'm a little skeptical with the current environment in Washington that there's a lot of movement that could happen in Congress, but I do think you could see some cleanup on the way ETFs are implemented in the, in, in the current SEC. Well, sort of on this subject, uh, we're going to visit here in just a moment with Advisor Shares Dan Aarons to spotlight their new Vice ETF. This holds companies involved with alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco, so it's more broad-based. But there are a handful of standalone marijuana ETFs in registration with the SEC. As a matter of fact, I think uh, Lair is hoping to transition next week, if I recall correctly. But the question I have is, are there enough investable companies in the cannabis space? Could there be some capacity issues with these ETFs? Yeah, I think that's a very serious concern, um, and it's one of the reasons we haven't seen the SEC approve a straight-up marijuana ETF yet. The two real concerns are if you're going to invest in U.S. companies, are they, are they at some sort of additional regulatory risk, and does that make them inappropriate as a, as a target? Um, and the way most funds seem to be getting around this is they're going after the public companies that are available, which either are either – related companies, i.e., you know, a fertilizer company, something like that, or, or perhaps a real estate investment trust that's owning land that's being used, um, or they're investing in Canadian companies where there are, you know, a few dozen very small companies that are, in fact, publicly traded that are directly involved in the space. So that brings with it all sorts of additional risks, right? I mean, you're now investing, you know, internationally in a set of small and or micro cap companies, regardless of what industry, that's a set of risks that you're taking as an investor. Now you're adding the layer of sort of the uncertainty around marijuana regulation. Um, I think these are are very speculative investments for most people. Um, So, uh, you know, while I think we'll see some of these products come to market, the capacity constraints are real, as are the risks. Dave, you mentioned that these may be speculative investments. There's no question about that. We have about two minutes left here. As you look at ETF proliferation overall, I'm curious, where do you fall on this? When you look at all the different thematic ETFs uh, that are out there, obviously there's a lot of talk about Bitcoin ETFs coming to market, marijuana ETFs. Uh, Do you ultimately think these are a good thing or a bad thing for investors? You know, we've got we've we've seen this this story before. We saw it in the mutual fund space, where we now have some 10,000 mutual funds available. Um, people have been saying there are too many mutual funds since the 80s, uh, and yet we still see continued product proliferation. You know, I think that there's a lot of room in the marketplace. You look at the successful launches this year. You know, whether it's the you know main sector rotation fund or principles, you know, multi-factor mega cap fund. Not every one of these is a tiny little niche fund. They're they're funds that serve a purpose. Right, they're either part of a larger asset allocation play, they're part of a distribution strategy, they're a tweak on an existing exposure, or they're a genuine new way of approaching a market like that Goldman, uh, you know, smart beta fixed income ETF. I was saying. So I think they, these choices are great to have out there for investors. There's no question that you've got more and more funds to look at, it puts more burden back on the investor to do your homework and really understand your exposure. Well, Dave, on that note, we'll have to leave it there. Always a pleasure having you on the program. Uh, Happy holidays to you and your family. And we certainly uh, look forward to seeing you down at the uh, Inside ETFs conference uh, in January. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thank you. That was Dave Nottig, CEO of ETF.com. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Dan Ahrens, Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer at Advisor Shares. We'll spotlight the Advisor Shares Vice ETF. This is the ETF Store Show. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Connor Kelly in studio. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF Store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 2,000 ETFs available to invest in. The ETF Store sorts through them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Advisor Shares Vice ETF, ticker symbol ACT, which, by the way, stands for Alcohol, 
cannabis and tobacco. This ETF just launched last Wednesday. And joining us via phone from New York to discuss this ETF is Dan Ahrens, Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer at Advisor Shares. He's also the portfolio manager for this ETF. Dan, welcome to the ETF Store Show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Dan, this is the first ETF providing concentrated exposure to companies associated with alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco, so-called SIN stocks. Take us from there. How many holdings are in this ETF? How are they selected? And what's the overall investment approach here? Sure, sure. Now, it's a fairly concentrated portfolio, uh, purposely, because we have a fairly limited universe of stocks to look at. Um, I will say that we are big believers in long-term alcohol and tobacco holdings. Uh, we think they perform well through good markets, bad markets, good economies, bad economies, somewhat recession-resistant. You know, People are going to drink and smoke no matter what's going on. And they're very high profit margin companies. Now, we are the first fund that's also going to have cannabis marijuana exposure it was not easy to do had a great deal of conversations with the exchanges with custodian banks a lot of comments back and forth with the sec to get this thing launched and i really want to stress that we're only investing in what's legal at a federal level and that's mainly biotech pharmaceutical type companies but we think our investable universe is going to grow in the future. Dan, can you give us an idea of some of the specific cannabis-related stocks? Who are some of the companies here, and what exactly do they do? Well, one that uh, always seems to amuse people, but we think is an excellent stock, is Scott's miracle Grow. Now, are they a marijuana or cannabis company? No. But uh, everybody that has some type of a uh, marijuana company list or index seems to include kind of miracle Grow, But um, other companies that are, are more fitting, um, there's some very good uh, pharmaceutical companies, AbbVie and Catalent. Now, I can't say it's their main business, but they are registered with the DEA to handle cannabis and what's called cannabinoids. They're working on drugs, medication to get FDA approved uh, using cannabis. Um, there's yet some other companies like Insys. And um, we have a handful right now, but I'm really looking to add a number of other companies in the coming weeks. I'm looking for good entry points. Um, can't really say what those are at this point, but it can be natural cannabis. It can be synthetic cannabinoids and companies that are looking to get FDA approvals for drugs. Dan, I'm sure we could spend, geez, an entire show talking about this, but very high level, what does the current regulatory landscape look like surrounding cannabis? I know it's very state-specific. There are a lot of nuances here, but where are we in terms of moving towards broader legalization? Well, we think it's going to come at some point. Now, the the current uh, government is negative on cannabis approval. And as you said, there are a number of states that have approved it in some form or fashion, and they vary. But the kicker is I don't really care about those. It doesn't make any difference to me because I can really only invest in what's legal at a federal level. And that's a, that's a big kicker um, because you're not going to find custodian banks and lots of other vendors that want to work with something that's legal in a state or even legal in Canada. It's not legal at a federal level in the U.S. So that's limiting. But at the same time, I'm investing in some great, in my opinion, pharmaceutical biotech companies. Um, there's not any crazy OTC and pink sheet cannabis stocks in here. Not, none of that. We're, we're looking at large companies but we still think there's tremendous upside by investing there. Our guest is Dan Ahrens, Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer at Advisor Shares. We're spotlighting the Advisor Shares Vice ETF, ticker symbol ACT. Dan, from an investment thesis standpoint, as you mentioned earlier, one thing about Vice stocks is that uh, 
People smoke and drink no matter what is going on in the economy. Uh, these stocks are viewed as being rather recession resistant. Can you expand on that a bit? What does the data actually look like here? Well, uh, first of all, cannabis, excuse me, tobacco. Tobacco is by far uh, the biggest profit margin consumer product. Um, the, the profit margins built into tobacco and all tobacco products are far exceed any other consumer product. That's how those tobacco companies stay profitable. Uh, now, even, you know, people look at smoking bans and uh, all the information that's out there about smoking and it's bad for you. But these companies have huge profit margins. They're also good innovators. There's an awful lot happening with uh, smokeless and vapes and uh, smoking secession technologies. That's how those tobacco companies are staying relevant. <laughs> they don't have much competition. There's no advertising. There's huge barriers to entry. If you simply look at a chart, pick a major tobacco company or pick the industry overall and look at the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, tobacco is an outperformer through good and bad markets. Alcohol, pretty much the same. Something else we see, Paul, though, is it's cyclical. Uh, sometimes high-end wine, high-end liquors are outperforming beer. Uh, also in beer, you see a big movement towards craft beers. Now we have a lot of craft liquors. Uh, we also see the big companies um, acquiring the small local craft distillers and craft brewers. So, um, again, pick a company, Diageo, Constellation Brands. Just look at these companies for the last 20 years. You're going to be impressed. We don't think there's any good reason that's going to stop. Now, one last piece about these. We think there's going to be a great deal of overlap between cannabis and alcohol and tobacco. If it is ever legalized at a federal level, who do you think is going to dominate that industry? The tobacco companies. They have patents. They have um, trademarks already for if and when federal legalization comes. We've also seen some alcohol companies already making investments in cannabis. It's not legal in the U.S., but they might make cannabis or marijuana beer for other parts of the world. These are also companies that have done a great job of navigating heavily regulated industries for decades. We think that dovetails nicely into uh, expansion that we think is coming in the future of cannabis. Again, we're spotlighting the advisor shares vice ETF, ticker symbol ACT. Dan, where does this ETF fit in an investment portfolio? Well, it's very simply a you know all equity fund. It depends on the individual and the advisor, but uh, I think it'd be part of a core. Uh, depending on how, how people set up their asset allocations, it could be a satellite type of holding to their core equity. Um, I had a, a good call last week with a, a, a big advisor, and he said he's hearing more and more from his clients recently, the, the same fears that come up every couple of years about is is the market getting frothy? Is it you know, you know is it getting high? Do I need some you know more downside protection? And he was agreeing with our thought that these alcohol tobacco companies can be rather recession resistant, but we think the cannabis exposure, the biotech, and the um, pharmaceutical works really well with that and provides some aggressive growth in the same fund. We think those really work well together. Dan, interestingly, you previously managed a mutual fund with a somewhat similar approach. Uh, you actually founded that fund. I'm curious, what made you decide to head down the ETF route? Well, uh, I'm at Advisor Shares and I've been here a number of years. We're in the business very simply of launching actively managed ETFs, and uh, most of our funds are sub-advised. We have some very good sub-advisors like Dorsey Wright, Wilshire, New Fleet, Pacific Asset, uh, but we always thought in the back of our minds, we don't want to do a vice ETF at some point when the time is right. We also had a lot of people contacting us wanting to do a marijuana or cannabis fund, and 
we told them we don't think that'll work. <laughs> we don't think there's enough to invest in that's federally legal, listed, large, liquid. Um, and then we got the idea of putting these things together. Um, um, although I wasn't a mutual fund business prior, an awful lot of people in the ETF space came from the mutual fund world. There's a great deal of similarities. We're all you know, 1940 Act investment companies. But I think the ETF is a better mousetrap, more tax efficient, can often have lower fees. Uh, you can use limit orders. There's a lot of reasons to be in the ETF um, chassis, if you will, as compared to the mutual fund chassis. Given that ETFs do require daily transparency, are you concerned at all with being front run? I know some other fund companies have voiced concerns and they've been hesitant to offer active strategies in ETFs because of these concerns. What's your take on front running? I think it's silly. I don't think there's risk of front running. I think these companies might want to, um, you know, keep their daily daily fund uh, transparency to themselves for other reasons. But a lot of people don't understand if I'm doing trades in my portfolio today, that's not public information until after the market closes. Our website updates overnight, and you can see the daily transparency holdings on our website tomorrow. That really doesn't make front running possible. And um, we are big believers in that transparency. I think investors should be able to see what's under the hood of the fund. We don't have anything to hide. We're proud of our holdings. Dan, we have about two minutes left here. What about just the case for active management? I'm sure you've seen all the data showing that active managers typically underperform their benchmarks after fees. What's the case for active management in this particular area of the market? Well, in this particular fund, I think it's extremely important. Um, you know, we're going to be in the big tobacco companies. We're going to be in the big alcohol companies. But I wouldn't want to be market cap weighted. Uh, we want to be able to pick and choose what we want to underweight and overweight. And when you look at cannabis, this is really just in its infancy, starting to get off the ground. I think there's going to be, let's call them landmines for investors out there. If they're trying to invest in penny stocks, uh, OTC, there's going to be a lot of hits and misses in, um, in marijuana and cannabis. I think uh, active management where we get to really know these companies well and pick and choose is extremely important here. I'm sure, uh, as you're aware, there are a handful of filings with the SEC for marijuana-focused ETFs. Uh, there already exists a standalone alcohol-focused ETFs. Uh, about 60 seconds left here. How do you see this area evolving moving forward, I guess particularly on the marijuana ETF side? Well, there's going to be funds come out in the future uh, if if and when there's federal uh, approval uh, at any point. But right now, I don't know if any of those funds are actually going to get launched and off the ground. I think there's a lot of headwinds. I don't think there's enough large listed liquid companies to invest in. Um, it's very easy to do a filing, initial filing for a fund, but let's uh, wait and see when and if these funds get off the ground. It's coming at some point. I don't think it's coming anytime soon. Well, Dan, with that, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, excellent ETF spotlight today. Congratulations on the launch of ACT. Uh, and I hope you and your family enjoy just a wonderful holiday season. Thank you. Thanks. You too. That was Dan Ahrens, Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer at Advisor Shares. Again, the ETF is the Advisor Shares Vice ETF, ticker symbol ACT. And you can learn more about this ETF by visiting advisorshares.com. Again, this ETF just launched uh, last Wednesday. I think it'll be a very interesting one to track. There is a lot of interest, uh, particularly around the, the cannabis angle. Uh, so I, it's just going to be fascinating to watch this space evolve uh, overall. That'll do it for today's show. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at etfstore.com, Apple iTunes, and Google Play. Connect with us on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Next week, we'll close out 2017 with a best of the ETF Store Show. We'll replay three of our favorite guest interviews from the back half of the year. Until then, happy holidays, everyone, and see you in 2018.